Good evening to you all. Thank you. <laughs> and congratulations to the graduates. So I have the privilege this evening uh, to break the bread of life with you uh, from the text that was just read into your hearing. I want to talk to you. This is the subject or the title of this message, On Grind for Glory. On Grind for Glory. And listen, this is the point of everything I want to say tonight uh, to you graduates and to everyone that is in here, and it is this. That the grace and the glory of Jesus Christ is both the source of ministry and the hope for ministry. The grace and the glory of Jesus Christ is both the source of ministry and the hope for ministry. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word that is not dead, but that is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword pierces to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, uh, judges the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Our confession tonight, Lord, is that every heart in here is naked and exposed to you, the one to whom we must all give account. So even in this night of celebration, would you be pleased to uh, through the preaching of your word, meet us where we are and give us what we need. Lord, if it is encouragement, would you encourage us in and through your word? If it is hope and faith, would you give us that gift? If it is correction, oh God, in your mercy, correct us. That we would be people who live for the glory, not ourselves, but of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, and amen. And now I, I readily admit to you that this title, uh, On Grind for Glory, does not necessarily convey an ex inspiring or inspirational message. Uh, the idea of being on grind kind of indicates a sense of difficulty and maybe even Hardship, we think about like grinding it out. Uh, even we might think about sounds of squealing in our, in our ears. Uh, yes, it's true. Uh, but it can indicate more than that. It can, it can indicate movement. You see, I definitely, <laughs> I definitely desire uh, to talk with you tonight about the challenge of ministry life as you graduate as you transition into whatever ministry call the Lord has for you as graduates, but I'm not talking tonight about uh, grinding to a halt. I'm talking about grinding to glory. This whole chapter of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in fact, is bracketed by the Apostle Paul's declaration that he is, in the Irwin Inch translation, going to stay on his grind. Here's what I mean. In verse 1, he says, For this reason, we do not lose heart. And then he repeats himself with the same words down in verse 16 of this chapter uh, when he says, therefore, we do not lose heart. What he is saying in these two statements is that, that, that it helps us understand what he says in the middle verses. We don't lose our motivation we don't lose our enthusiasm. In other words, to put it positively, we stay on our grind. No matter how bleak or how bad it is, we stay on our grind. Why, Paul? Because these things are light and momentary afflictions, and what they are doing is preparing an eternal weight of glory for us that is far beyond comparison. We stay on grind for glory. And he explains what this grind for glory looks like. I want to encourage you towards uh, three things as you prepare for where the Lord is taking you from this point 
forward into whatever ministry context comes next. We we'll talk about grinding, grinding by grace, grind, grinding against the darkness and grinding in hope. Paul says in verse 1, therefore having this mercy, having this, this ministry rather by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. We stay on our grind. When you see a therefore in the Bible, right, you probably know, you want to ask, what is it therefore, right? Uh, being clued in to the fact that a statement of result is about to take place, usually that means we have to look backwards to what has been said before it to figure out what is being spoken of. But in this case, the answer is right here in verse 1. Therefore, Paul is saying, we don't lose heart, we stay on our grind because we have something. It's because we possess this ministry as recipients of mercy. That makes us ask a question. The question is, what ministry is this that you have, Paul? And now we get to take a look back to the text previously to find out what this ministry is. This ministry, Paul says that he has, he describes it in three ways in chapter three of this same letter to the Corinthians. One of the things he's been dealing with uh, uh, in the, the, the message to the Corinthians are opponents who've come into the church and tried to invalidate the apostles' message. So he says at the beginning of chapter 3, are we beginning to commend ourselves to you again? Do we need letters of recommendation to you or from you? And then he says in verses 4 to 6 of that chapter, the confidence we have through Christ toward God is that even though we're not sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, our sufficiency is from God. He has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant. The ministry that he possesses is a new covenant ministry. He's not a minister of the old covenant that he says is written on tablets of stone. He's not a minister of the law because a change has come. Christ has come and he has brought about the reality of a new covenant that gets written on people's hearts on the inside and not on tablets of stone. He says in verse 7 of chapter 3 that the old covenant was a ministry of death. It condemned people. Even so, it came came with incredible glory because it came from God. The new covenant ministry, he says in verse 8 of chapter 3, is the ministry of the Spirit. That is, the Holy Spirit is poured out in this ministry. Therefore, it has even more glory than the old covenant. Not only that, the ministry he has is the new covenant ministry, which is the ministry of the Spirit. So it's also the ministry of righteousness in verse 9 of chapter 3. For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. This new covenant ministry is the ministry of the Spirit who works to make people righteous in God's sight. This is the ministry that he is talking about in verse 1 of chapter 4. This is the ministry that he possesses and the thing that enables him to keep going, the thing that enables him to stay on his grind is that he's clear on the fact that he possesses this ministry by grace. The ministry has come to him by the grace of God. Not because he was somehow deserving or sufficient for it. He says in verse 1, we have this ministry as recipients of mercy. We're not deserving recipients. We don't make this ministry happen. The Spirit does. We don't make people righteous. The Spirit does. That's why we stay on our grind. That's why we don't lose our motivation. What we do instead of losing our motivation is, in verse 2, we instead renounce disgraceful and underhanded ways. What he is saying there is we don't have ulterior motives. We don't have some hidden and shameful agenda when we engage people with this ministry. We're an open book. 
We're not trying to trick people into the kingdom of God. We refuse to live our lives by cunning or craftiness. We refuse to tamper with God's word instead of trying to be cunning and slick by the open disclosure of the truth. We are commending ourselves to each and every person's conscience in the sight of God. And this is all driven by the grace of God. And this is a big deal. It's a big deal. Why? Because at the very beginning of this letter, he tells the Corinthians, we want you to be aware of the afflictions we experienced in Asia. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. We felt like we had received the sentence of death, but this was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And here is the connection. He has to tell them this because the Corinthian Christians had cultural values of their society that clashed with the new values that they were given in Christ. The idea of possessing glory and power were cherished culturally speaking. Here Paul is saying to them that this new covenant ministry is full. It is full of surpassing glory. It's empowered by the very Spirit of God. What they didn't get was that it wasn't about their personal empowerment so that they could be honored and glorified and put in positions of wealth and esteem in this world. And so the 21st century isn't that different from the 1st century. Listen, I know... Brothers and sisters, I know none of you who are graduating this evening intend to make the ministry that God has called you to about yourself. I know that none of you intend to grind forward in ministry solely by your gifts and not by grace. But each of you is gifted, each of you is gifted, each of you has been equipped by this institution, each of you is called by God to his kingdom service. And it is easy, especially when fatigued and tired, to do ministry in a way that leans on the gifts while neglecting the gift giver. Uh, 18 years ago now, Two months before my first semester at RTSDC, I preached my trial sermon uh, at New Bethel Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. on 9th and S Street Northwest. And it was, a, it was a night that was full of butterflies. It was a Thursday evening, normal uh, prayer and Bible study that the pastor had said, we're going to have the trial sermon as a worship service this night. And, you know, I've been going through all kind of machinations about the, the message. And, and, uh, 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 and I remember the title of the message, When You Fall Short. And, I, and now this is a, this is a, it was a, and still is, predominantly African-American uh, Baptist church. So they were a little more uh, vocal than we are in here. But I had a couple of things I weren't, wasn't prepared for, right? One, how, how the Spirit of God would, would, would lift me in the preaching of God's Word. Two, how much I would actually sweat. <laughs> That's why I never preach without something to wipe the sweat. But the... the the, the congregation responded overwhelmingly to that sermon. Overwhelmingly, they, were, the resp they responded. And, and, and when, I, when I finished and I prayed and I sat down and the congregation is responding so powerfully, and that, do you know what the first thought that came through my mind was? I sat down, full pro sweat pouring off of me, and I said to myself, oh, my God, this is intoxicating. I said, I see how pastors fall. I said, Lord, help me. <laughs> help me not make this about me. 
Help me, Lord, because I hear the adulation and I want to take it in and I want to think that I'm more than I actually am. Listen, I know you don't intend. (laughs) I know when you utilize the gifts that God has given you in ministry that you've been equipped to, there will be responses that that are positive, that are affirming to the gifts that God has given you, but it's not about you. It's not about you. And it is only yours by grace. You only receive it as, uh, uh, by the mercies of God. And so, grinding by grace takes you off the throne in your own mind and heart. That's the kind of transformation, actually, that everybody needs. It's the kind of transformation that the world needs. And listen... Here it is, the reason why this grind has to be by grace is because it's a grind against the darkness. Notice what he says at the end of verse 2, we are commending ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. We're not uh, discriminating about we, who we extend this transforming grace to. This word every is in the position of emphasis in the Greek text. He's saying we commend ourselves to every possible variety of human conscience, Corinthian and non-Corinthian, Christian and non-Christian alike, and this has to be by grace because not everybody's going to receive it. We're going to lay out the gospel plainly, he's saying, so that everyone can judge for themselves, but not everybody's going to judge rightly. These are hard words in verses 3 to 4. He says, but if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this age has blinded the mind of the unbelievers to present, to prevent them from seeing the light of the, glo- go- uh, the, of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. These are hard words to hear, but they shouldn't actually be difficult words to grasp. Darkness is real. Evil is real. And sometimes we experience the depths of darkness and evil in our ministry life. We experience the trauma of it. But what people often do not want to do is acknowledge the spiritual reality of evil. We're responsible for the evil that we do individually, but we have help doing it. Paul speaks in terms of two ages, the present age and the age to come. The age to come is the age of glory when everything wrong will be made right and it will be clear to all that Jesus is Lord and God and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess it. But in the present age, Satan still has influence. As you press into ministry, you will experience evil. You will encounter it. Don't be deceived. You will encounter evil people. You will encounter evil systems and structures that oppress and destroy people. You see, the Bible, the Bible takes Satan seriously. It's people who don't. First question, I, I know it's because y'all are graduating, so y'all know this, right? The first question in Westminster Shorter Catechism is, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is, right, to glorify God and enjoy him fully forever. Well, we could also ask, what is the chief end of Satan? What is it? The answer would be to deny God his rightful glory by preventing people from enjoying him forever. Paul is saying this grind for glory is a grind against the darkness because Satan is real. In the first century, Corinth, people wouldn't have had an issue believing that there were spiritual forces of evil. We're more challenged to believe that there is an active, conscious evil being that we actually can't see. And he's actually at work. And he actually wants to resist anything that brings glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. That means he wants to resist you in your ministry calling. 
It's a grind against the darkness because there's a veil over the minds of those who don't believe and those who don't believe don't realize they have a veil over their minds. They don't realize that spiritually speaking, they cannot see. And what's so hard about this is unbelief has consequences. Paul says if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. This ministry of the Spirit This ministry that fixes you spiritually can't be seen by you. You're perishing, he says. He's used this language of veiled and unveiled already in chapter 3, speaking of his fellow Jews. He says in 3.14, their minds were hardened to, to this day when they read the Old Covenant, he said, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And now he's expanding the description to every person who does not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The difficult truth is that to perish means to be separated from God to forever, to face the wrath of God and the punishment of hell. And notice this with me, even though Satan is real, no one's going to be able to say, the devil made me do it. Satan works to blind the minds of unbelievers. He doesn't make them unbelievers, right? I was already an unbeliever. He didn't have to make me one. But what he does is encourage people In their unbelief, he works to make people discredit Christianity, works to make you say Christians are silly. Why believe in a Jesus I can't see? He works to help you say if if God was good, then there wouldn't be so much suffering. He encourages people to believe there can't be one true religion. He makes people think you're, you're right when you say a loving God wouldn't send anybody to hell. A loving God wouldn't deny me the satisfaction of being affirmed in whoever I want to be or however I want to live. Satan works to help people deny the truth, which means he will work against you, so you have to grind against the darkness. Look, before this week, it seemed like we had, like, endless days of heavy rain. And the reality is, right, that even when the clouds and the rain were covering our area, it doesn't mean that the glorious light of the sun wasn't shining. It was just hidden to us. We couldn't see it. We grind against the darkness because even when people can't see the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean his glory doesn't shine. It simply means that people are being affirmed in their unbelief by a false God. In other words, we grind against the darkness empowered by God's grace because we have a certain hope. And here's my final point. We grind for God's glory because we grind in hope. Hope. Darkness, that darkness does not actually have the final say. Darkness doesn't get to win the day. Paul basically says to the Corinthians in verse 5, I'm your slave for Jesus' sake because of what Jesus has done for me and because of the ministry that he has given to me by mercy, I am your slave. And I know it says servant in verse 5, but we can see that word and not realize the depth of commitment that he has for them. Because he's a slave of Jesus Christ, he's a slave of the Corinthians, and what he keeps communicating to them, what he keeps proclaiming to them is Jesus Christ as Lord. He's making a distinction between himself and those who are trying to discredit him uh, among the Corinthians. They're trying to make much of themselves, he's saying, but here's the mark of true ministry. The minister who makes much of himself is no minister at all. The minister who makes ministry about him, who doesn't pursue this, uh, this combination of the open proclamation of the truth of God's word along with the humble commitment to serve the people is, a dis- is discredited as a minister. I know I'm running out of time, but this is for free. It's not part of the point. Look, if, if someone, if you see somebody who claims to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who's making the ministry about them and their platform, don't walk, run away. Here's the point. Paul can continue to grind against the darkness, yes, because he grinds by grace, but also because he grinds in hope. 
he commits himself to them like a slave. Realize, realize, do you, have you read Corinthians? Like, do you, do you know about that church? Realize these are not people who have their act together. These are people who are struggling to live out the implications of the gospel. These are people who have all kinds of issues who are living like Christ has made no difference to them. Why would he commit himself to them? It's because he grinds in hope. His statement of hope is verse 6. The God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to illuminate the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. From the very beginning, God God has been a specialist in bringing light into the darkness. He says, I proclaim Christ as Lord because he has shined a light into the darkest reaches of my heart, and I therefore know that he can shine his light into the darkest reaches of your heart also. Isaiah was right when he said to the people that one day the Lord would be their everlasting light and their glo- God would be their glory. And Paul is saying, it's happened for me and because of God's mercy, I now see that glory in the face of Jesus Christ. I keep going and I want you to see it too. I keep grinding, I don't lose my motivation for ministry because I am driven by that same hope manifesting itself among you, Corinthians. As you transition through this graduation into whatever ministry calling God is giving you, that must be your same hope that you see now the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and you are driven by that hope manifesting itself in the lives of whoever God calls you to use the gifts he gives you in service to his kingdom purposes. Why will you press forward in your ministry calling? Why will you commit yourselves even through difficulty to extend the grace of Jesus Christ to all without discrimination? It is because of this singular reality. God has shown in our hearts to illuminate them with the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Our eyes have been opened by grace And we live in the hope that he will use us to open the eyes of others to see this same glorious Jesus we've come to know and love. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, again, your word. And we pray, Lord, that for everyone in here, not just graduate, but everyone in these pews and on this stage that our hope for life is that you have shown in our hearts to illuminate them with the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And this would be our motivation for life now and forevermore to the glory of his name. Amen.